My name is Joan Casey, and I'm with Educational Advocates College Consulting, a founder and lead consultant. The goal today is to help you understand the factors related to the pandemic test optional policies that are impacting current high school seniors, class of 2021, in the admissions decisions they're likely to receive this month. It certainly hasn't been an easy year for current high school seniors, and the resilience that we've seen among our clients is remarkable, given the, the at this point, a year of remote or hybrid learning, so many test cancellations. And even though it hasn't been easy for any of us, these students have really persevered and deserve a lot of credit. So one of the things that has happened this year is that it has been a huge increase of the number of applications filed per student. So overall, the common application is only up 1%, but the number of applications each student filed has really skyrocketed. This chart here shows a combination of early decision, early action, and some overall applications. You can see on the bottom there that Colgate University more than doubled the number of applications they received over last year. And honestly, beyond the fact that, that it was test optional and students felt free to apply to more schools, I don't even think the Colgate admissions office could probably explain why they had so many uh, additional applications. This digs in a little bit deeper on the data. So in the middle there, you see private, large, more selective colleges, and like the ones on the previous screen. But in this case, they're defining more selective as those colleges that admit more than 50% and large as institutions that are larger than 10,000. And there was a 20% increase to applications to those schools. You can see to the right, of that, the public large, less selective. So less selective in this case means they admitted less than 50%. And when you think about it, you know, most people in our country um, go to colleges that admit about 75%. The, the private institutions that students attend is only really about 18%, believe it or not. So, you know, the most state flagships um, would be in this category, you know, with the exceptions of the uber selective ones like Berkeley and UVA. And you can see the big increase there over last year with the orange being this year, the blue being last year, there was a 14% increase. Now, interestingly, there have been some decreases as well. So some of the small publics um, had, had declines um, in applications. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with them. And then another factor that's contributed to the complexity of what will happen with the admissions decisions that come out this month is that international applications are on the rise again. So you can see here that pretty much across the board, there's been an increase with the exception of a steep decline from China. And, and Colleges reported that after the election, there was an there was an uptick in international applications. So in the past, with the pandemic and concerns about immigrations and other issues in this country, there had been a period of time where students from other countries were a little bit less interested in uh, coming to college in the United States. But I think the thing that's interesting about this for the, in terms of the admissions officers is that when they think about admitting these students, they're also wondering, you know, will these students actually come? Will they be able to get visas? Will travel restrictions be lifted? So there's a lot of questions as to whether uh, it makes sense to admit very many international students. Another complicating factor is as many parents of high school students and high school students know, last year, so many went pass fail because of remote learning. Other, call, other high schools also did things like issue, uh, earn credit, but not issue a grade. And even this year, there's been quite a lot of grade inflation reported by high schools. So because they realize it's very difficult to truly assess a student's learning, they are giving out more A's than they perhaps normally would. And the truth is grade inflation has been on the rise, um, starting with colleges many years ago 
and you know, it, ending up uh, impacting high schools as well, but we're seeing it even more so this year. So if you're a college admissions officer, certainly you can look at the rigor of a student's curriculum and their teacher recommendations. And I think that those things were probably looked at quite closely this year, but it's hard for them to discern what does an A really mean anymore? So all of these things um, came together to create somewhat of a perfect storm. So we had, you know, students saying to themselves, you know, gee, I think I'll apply to Brown this year. You know, I have the grades, I have interesting activities, I have the rigor in my curriculum choices. You know, if it were last year, I don't think I would have the test score, so I probably wouldn't have applied, but test scores are not an obstacle for me this year. So I'm gonna apply. And I think this kind of calculus played in students' heads um, and caused them to apply to so many schools. I think the other thing is that they weren't really able to visit campuses or get a feel for campuses in quite the same way as in years past. So it was almost like shooting uh, darts at a dartboard. Well, I'll apply to a lot of schools and then maybe, you know, I'll see what happens. Maybe I'll be able to visit some colleges, you know, in the spring and I'll be able to figure out which one I like best. So um, I think all of those things also contributed to um, so many applications per student. So one of the things that um, we talk to our clients quite a lot about to help them understand where admissions officers are coming from is this concept of yield. So you can see from this chart, that the admissions and the enrollment management side of a college or university is very much a business. And you know, they, they approach attracting students very much like a, any business selling a product or service would. And um, enrollment management's job is to enroll a class and their job might include taking directives from the president of the college or university, the board of trustees. And that could be anything from, um, we wanna increase the caliber of our students. So we want stronger students. Um, maybe we want to shift our campus culture um, from, from being to, to attract students who care more about social justice. Um, maybe there's a, there's a call to have more socioeconomic diversity. Maybe they want more full pay students, whether those be international students or students from the US. It can be, it really ranges depending on the goals of the institution. And those are not things that an individual applicant can control. So all as an applicant can do is put together their best application and be their genuine selves. But what can happen with yield is that sometimes colleges will not admit students who are actually on the high end of the applicant pool. So for example, let's say the average GPA for a particular school is a 3.7 unweighted, most students have, you know, a number of honors in AP classes, and applicants could apply at a 3.8 or a 3.9 with stellar scores in really interesting activities, and then they get deferred. And you've probably heard these stories. So why does that happen? Well, the, the college uh, has developed predictive algorithms, and they're trying to determine if we offer this student admission, will this student come? And they look at a whole bunch of factors, everything from where you live, your parents' level of education, you know, how students from your high school have reacted to admissions office in the offers in the past. You know, have you showed interest? Like where in the country are you located? You know, your ability to pay, all kinds of factors like that. And they can determine how likely it is you'll accept their offer of admission. And if they don't think you will, then they will defer you or wait list you in the case of a regular decision application. And why do they do this? Well, they, they want to appear more selective. They, they understand that when families and students are looking at colleges, right or wrong, they sometimes pay attention to how selective a school is, even though school selectivity does not necessarily equal quality, but I think in people's heads it does. So it also affects things like rankings. So um, they want to they want to maintain those bragging rights. Like we had a record twenty percent, you know, um, admission rate this year, and they know that if they admit too many people that won't come, then their admission rate won't won't be that low. 
So, so that's what's happening. Um, and that's why sometimes you're scratching your head, like I should have gotten into this school um, and you don't, it's, it's through no fault of your own. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the enrollment manage, manager for, for this year, like they have all these applications, they really don't have any idea of what to expect for yield. So what they're gonna do is, is they're gonna use wait lists um, to, to quite an extent and, and partly to protect their perceived selectivity as I just explained. Um, if they don't get the enrollment uh, deposits that they need, then they will turn to the wait list, you know, usually after May 1st, although last year when the pandemic hit, many colleges started going to the wait list very early in April, and that could happen again this year. Um, some colleges, you know, many students took a gap year that was supposed to be college freshmen this year. And um, some colleges have said that that really wouldn't affect this year's acceptance rate, but that they might increase the class if they had to, you know, in order to accommodate those who took the gap year as well as the requisite number of, of new freshmen. Um, so, you know, some of the schools that will play this yield game that I was talking about where, you know, would include places like Tulane, University of Michigan, University of Miami, Virginia Tech, but frankly, a lot of them do. Some do it more than others. So as um, if you're a junior listening to this, as you plan your apply list, you wanna make sure that you don't just have those kinds of schools on your list, that you definitely have colleges on your list that don't play the Yale game, that will admit you based on your qualifications. So uh, the upshot here is, as I said earlier, um, you want to anticipate waitlist offers, particularly from the most selective colleges on your list. Um, you also should embrace the choices you do have because um, you will have to deposit somewhere by May 1st. There has been some talk of pushing back um, the deposit uh, date, but as of right now, you should probably plan on doing that by May 1st. Um, and decisions, if you stay on waitlist, decisions may not be settled until pretty deep into the summer. So if you don't like uncertainty, then you may not want to stay in a waitlist. Or maybe I wouldn't recommend staying on too many waitlists because that could really feel um, very unsettling. But if there's really a college that you're really interested in, you can certainly stay on the waitlist. Um, there's a, there's a um, gentleman named Rick, uh, Rick Clark, who's the Dean of Admission at Georgia Tech, and he writes a blog that's closely followed by consultants and guidance counselors and people who work in admission. And interestingly, this past week, he wrote about this very topic. So I just want to read um, just to help you understand where the enrollment management is coming from. He writes, right now, admission enrollment leaders around the country are obsessing over the models they developed to predict student yield behavior. They are looking back at pre-pandemic information and weighing that against 2020, in addition to praying more and sleeping less and so on. And so some of the questions uh, that, that enrollment management might, managers might be asking themselves are, will students be willing to travel as far from home given the uncertainty of fall course delivery being in person? Will test optional admits yield differently than the historical model predicts? So, you know, this year, 44% of students who filed the Common App went test optional compared to 77% last year. So that's a quite a difference. And I don't think they quite know how to interpret that. And then they're also wondering very specifically about certain demographics, like questions like how will females from the Northeast admitted to the sciences yield? So um, as you know, just to sum up, um, probably the selectives will go to the wait list. Uh, they might not go as, as deep to the wait list because people always clamor to go to schools that admit 25%, but they still will be using the wait list. Um, the large public universities will probably do very well with their in-state students because there's a pandemic, there's a lot of financial insecurity. Um, Out-of-state students may not fare as well and the large publics may, to, may go to the uh, wait list for them. Some of the smaller schools that admit more than 50%, 
might struggle to meet enrollment goals, uh, particularly if uh, they're, they're offering a more expensive education during this time. And so, the, so my advice to students is to really embrace your choices, ask a lot of questions, attend accepted student days, even if they're online, learn as much as you can about the colleges to which you've been admitted and make a, a strong choice. And then if you, again, if you stay on the wait list, um, maybe just stay on one or two wait lists. If there's really a school that you want to attend, you can write them a letter and you can let them know that if they admit you, you will come. Keep in mind that when you're admitted off the wait list, you don't always get a very generous financial aid or merit aid package. So if you're relying on fin financial aid to go to college, please keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, you know, you, you might have go to a high school where a guidance counselor or a dean might be willing to make a call for you to the school. That really varies from school to school. So that wraps it up. And I hope this information um, is helpful to you and helps you understand that if your news is a little disappointing or if you get a lot of wait lists, there's a reason for it and that it's not you. And I wish you the best of luck with your transition to college. Thank you so much for listening.